I wanted to start with a, a couple of uh, warnings. Uh, the first is that it's a, it's a red paper, I'm afraid. Um, I was giving a, a paper, a talk about a week ago at a workshop on the psychedelic humanities. And uh, another participant emailed in the middle of the workshop, in the middle of my talk, actually saying, I'm finding your essay really interesting, <laughs> uh, which of course was a, a comment on the uh, style of delivery. Um, but it's an important set of subjects, and I want to make sure that I get the, the argumentation right. Um, the, the second warning more seriously is that I am going to be talking about sexual assault, uh, among other things, and trauma, uh, the trauma of that. So that this is a content or a, a, a trigger warning. In the increasingly polarized and melodramatic domestic political life of the United States over the last three decades, cross-party consensus has been quite exceptional. Two totemic focal points of such exceptional consensus have been the sexually abused child in the construction of cross-party consensus around sexual predator legislation in the early to mid-1990s, and the traumatized war veterans around whom MAPS has more recently engineered quite a fragile consensus on the need to loosen prohibitionist drug control legislation. Now, I'm not among those who would seek to downplay the extraordinary political as well as scientific achievement of MAPS in beginning to undo that prohibitionist stranglehold. And nor do I believe that their focus on veterans and, to a lesser extent, emergency services workers has been merely strategic. But I think it clearly has been strategic, politically speaking, and indeed extremely effective. But as the consensus around prohibition begins to weaken gradually and, and piecemeal, of course, uh, questions are beginning to be asked about the new consensus, which is gradually uh, replacing it. In other words, the consensus around the treatment of traumatic injury with psychedelics. I'm going to suggest in, in the paper today uh, that questions must be asked about the nature politically and socially of trauma before we can know what it means to treat it with psychedelics. And I'm going to dis deploy in the paper a perspective on trauma, a critical perspective on trauma, and the techniques of political governance which are allied with it and which extend beyond the consulting room that I advanced in a co-authored book with Tim Dean entitled Hatred of Sex, uh, which was published last year. So trauma is about much more than its neurobiology, of course. And it's clear that in certain respects, our society revolves around trauma. And that's true of the left, and it's also true, I think, of the right. So Me Too and Black Lives Matter on the one side, and on the other, the victimized Trump and proletariat, as we might call them, or raving incels, and all of these groups, in a way, construct claims to political legitimacy and identity by way of a shared experience of traumatic injury. Indeed, I think it's the mobility of trauma-focused ways of thinking, if you like, politics of ressentiment in a Nietzschean sense, and the possibility of trauma being deployed on the right as well as on the left that should make us, and when I say us, I mean thinkers on the left, so I'm making some assumptions there should make us want to think a bit more deeply about trauma uh, than perhaps we are necessarily inclined to do. So the political theorist Wendy Brown in her 1995 book, States of Injury, argues that injury or trauma has become a significant way in which political experience in our societies is organized and understood. Communities of injured identity, as she calls them, coalesce around a shared experience of traumatic injury. Now, of course, this probably isn't the way that many activist organizations on the left, advocating, say, for the rights of women and minorities, or still less, I think, uh, organizers on the right would think of their own experience and their own activities. But I, I believe, nevertheless, that Brown's account is largely correct as a deep level of 
analysis of this common dimension of their politics. So if we assume uh, for a moment, and it is an assumption, but if we assume for the sake of argument that psychedelics uh, can be very effective cures for uh, PTSD and other traumatic after effects, if we, if we assume that hypothetically, and if we also accept Wendy Brown's analysis, uh, then I think we're in a difficult position because we're in danger of losing the material and embodied bases around which much of our politics is now organized on left and, and right alike. In other words, the injury inscribed on the bodies and the minds of the traumatized. It's paradoxical though it might seem, this shared embodied memory of traumatization might be something it's politically important to remember and in some senses retain, even if individual survivors and sufferers might want to be free of the more troubling uh, symptoms of their condition. And we might also want them to be, to be free of those conditions. Um, but if you think about something like uh, the, the psychiatrist Bessel van der Kolk's uh, uh, famous uh, 2014 book, When the Body Keeps the Score, uh, many people reading that book are very shocked to discover that the first uh, trauma survivor that we encounter narratively in the progression of that work is a, a Vietnam veteran who's kept awake at night uh, by uh, uh, images of uh, Vietnamese children that, that he slaughtered during, during, the, con uh, during the conflict. Um, now, if uh, we, so we might then want to say that on a, a kind of collective, if you like, national level, uh, it's important that violent wars of aggression like Vietnam not be wageable in ways that have little or no human cost on those who wage them. So in other words, if it were possible to very effectively treat PTSD among the military and law enforcement, one can readily imagine that leading to a normalization of violence, it leading to violence becoming even more so an ordinary part of doing politics. So rather than a zero trauma society, psychedelics risk becoming embroiled in a world in which there is much more violence, quicker individualized recovery from it by those who inflicted it, and consequently less reflection on its consequences for the victims. Despite the plane of neurobiological and moral equivalence that trauma-based thinking attempts to establish between different types of trauma and their survivors, it is, I think, a political fact that some people's trauma is recognized more readily and more highly than others. My suggestion is that in the current constitution of our society, the intergenerational and collective trauma experienced by survivors and descendants of, uh, descendants of survivors of colonialism and its after echoes in racism is relatively speaking devalued and barely commodified. So too the traumatic effects experienced collectively by what we used to call the working class as a result of poverty. Indeed, all such lower intensity but repetitive traumatic injury produced by structural violence of various kinds. And by contrast, and I mean no offense in saying this, although offense could well be taken, uh, the trauma experienced by war veterans survivors of sexual abuse and other victims of more spectacular or spectacularly sinister violence and the traumatized identities that can be co-constructed from those experiences are now, I think, relatively highly valued and highly commodified. So it's against the backdrop of this very outlined structural analysis that I've just presented that I want to turn now to the Power Trip uh, podcast series produced by members of the Symposia Collective, a self-styled watchdog organization based in New York City, uh, with whose work I'm sure many of you will be familiar. So these podcasts seek to expose and denounce the prevalence of sexual abuse in the psychedelic communities, community in the Americas, uh, and in particular to attack maps for its alleged negligence and insouciance with regard to the work of two psychotherapists on one phase two clinical trial of MDMA for the treatment of PTSD. Taken together, the podcasts, uh, the first of which aired in November 2021, frame a damning indictment of the psychedelic community in that part of the world. Uh, the community both in its underground illicit and its public overground scientific branches. Uh, an indictment of a community then in which sexual abuse is rife, 
and goes largely unchallenged. The podcasts also dramatize and foreground the investigative labor of the two principal presenter journalist researchers, the couple Lily K. Ross and her partner and co-investigator, David or Dave Nichols. And it depicts them, or they depict themselves, uh, as valiantly struggling to cut through layer upon layer of individual, collective, and corporate denial. And they position themselves as the caring allies and amplificatory collaborators of the handful of victims and survivors whom they encounter along the way. The series clearly aspired to stage a powerful Me Too moment for the psychedelic community and its institutions, and to some extent, I think, successfully. But it was also the collective's most strident and pointed attack to date on prominent institutional targets that it had already designated and already attacked in other terms in earlier skirmishes. Although many individuals and indeed institutions are called out in the series of podcasts, the principal target around whom the entire series clearly revolves is MAPS for its failure to adequately oversee the work of a husband and wife therapist couple, Donna Dreyer and Richard Jensen, uh, in this phase two clinical trial of MDMA. A trial in which it was alleged that uh, during the trial and subsequently one participant, Megan Buisson, whom we hear from in the podcast series, was sexually assaulted. I'm gonna come to the substance of these allegations in a moment, but before I do, I want to discuss the wider aims of the podcast and to comment on the several ways in which the podcast first seeks to establish its authority and prepares the ground narratively and performatively for its attack on MAPS. Since, as the presenters acknowledge, MAPS had already made a public statement two years prior to the podcast airing, so in 2019, acknowledging ethical violations by these two therapists, in some respects, a power trip's investigation is less remarkable for the facts that it uncovers than for the dramatizing reconstruction of them. Evidently, the objective of the series vastly exceeds simply condemning MAPS's oversight of this particular clinical trial, or even the issue of oversight in clinical trials generally, and rather aims to cast doubt on the credibility of MAPS's entire vision for a future in which psychedelically assisted psychotherapy for PTSD would be overseen by accredited psychotherapists on an individualized medical basis. And members of the Symposia Collective have previously contested this model in earlier publications, in particular in very influential attacks on the so-called uh, corporadelic commercial investors seeking to monop monopolize a new and lucrative market for psychedelic therapy while also supporting the maintenance of prohibitionist legislation in furtherance of their commercial interests. I'm quite sympathetic to the objectives of that earlier critique, but I think it's important to recognize that the Power Trip series is reframing those sober objections in the form of a highly sensationalized uh, rerun of Me Too from which many a listener will no doubt emerge convinced of and sensitized to the omnipresent danger of sexual abuse within psychedelic therapy. Now, as with MAPS's focus on the figure of the veteran, I do not mean to suggest that Symposia's expose on sexual abuse in the psychedelic community is merely strategic, but I do nevertheless contend that it is strategic, seeking to deliver a crushing blow to essentially the same institutional targets as have been identified in their earlier work. The series builds towards its attack on MAPS and MAPS's therapeutic model by first establishing the credentials of its lead presenter, who discloses in the second episode the story of her own experience of sexual assault in an underground psychedelic setting in Ecuador. It then focuses extensively on the work of the Mexican psychiatrist Salvador Roquette, whose model of psychedelic therapy called psychosynthesis involved a phase in which the client's psychological defenses were deliberately broken down. Roquette, as you may know, was a champion of indigenous Mexican psychedelic cultures and sought to blend them with Western and 
Western psychiatric and psychotherapeutic approaches, but he was also a right-wing Mexican nationalist. And he may very well have used psychedelics in the interrogation of a prominent left-wing dissident, which, if the interrogation was conducted in the way that the manner, in the manner alleged by the dissident, would certainly have amounted to torture. Listeners to the podcast with a limited knowledge of the history of psychedelics or with no such knowledge would very likely come away with the impression that in the 1950s and 60s, the bad actors in this area all came from below the southern border of the United States. But of course, these were decades in which research funded by the CIA sought to explore the potential in these substances for mind control and interrogation. And a number of uh, deaths and other harms ensued from that research. The way in which the podcast focuses so extensively on Roquette, and then much later discloses that Jensen had been a student of Roquette's among other people, and that psychosynthesis was one of the th therapeutic methods in the MAPS therapy manual at the time, in effect, performative, performatively establishes a sinister network of tainted influence, very reminiscent of pedophilia conspiracy theory. Quite unwittingly, I believe, but nevertheless quite emphatically, the series also redeploys some of the worst xenophobic and racialized tropes of North American anti-drug scaremongering in its phantasmatic presentation of a tentacular network of sinister influence stemming from Roquette as the Mexican peril. Middle-class white American womanhood is at risk from these monsters, seems to be the message. The presenters ultimately succumb, in a way, to their bleakly conspiracist view of the tentacular taint infecting the entire psychedelic community. Ross, in one of the last episodes, recounts uh, being approached for advice by an old acquaintance who wanted to try psychedelic therapy. Uh, and her response on noticing that the acquaintance's proposed guide had trained at an institute with which one of the people featured previously in the series had some affiliation. Her response is in its way extremely eloquent, I think, about the way in which she now sees the world through a conspiracist vision of omnipresent danger, infection, and putrefaction. So she says, uh, and I'm going to quote her here, uh, I was like, oh, oh, don't do that. Don't do that. I was just this feeling like an infection had spread everywhere and could touch anybody that I care about end of quotation. The neo-Gothic tentacular rhetorical monster had escaped the confines of its persuasive purpose and consumed its creator. I want to turn now to the way in which the Buisson case, the centerpiece of the entire series, is presented, and I shall argue distorted in the very extensive coverage it receives in episodes six and seven. A Buisson, a former international speed skater and survivor of sexual abuse, who speaks in these episodes, participated in the MAPS-sponsored trial that I mentioned in 2014 to 15. Along with a handful of other trial participants interviewed by the investigators, Buisson reports finding that the amount of therapy allowed for within the trial design was woefully insufficient, and that the therapy caused a resurfacing of traumatic material, which became difficult to assimilate. As she puts it, there was just no way to get through all of this before the trial was over. Nevertheless, Buisson, like most of the other trial participants, responded to researchers' questions during and immediately after the trial by affirming that the therapy had in fact been helpful, indeed helpful in a life-changing way. And most of the psychometric indicators showed significant relief. To the extent that the podcast registers this as an inconsistency with later reactions, it seeks to explain it away in terms of the expectancy of the participants, their desire to please the therapists and the researchers, and ultimately to lay the blame again squarely at MAPS's institutional door for overhyping the potential of the therapy. In what seems to me a very significant development in the case history over which the podcast does not linger, following the conclusion of the trial in 2015, Buisson decided to relocate to Cortes Island in British Columbia, an island uh, that you can only reach by air or by water, where Dreyer and Jensen, the therapists, had made their home. 
Wee Song got a job on a farm and began to socialize with her therapists. And she acknowledges that at that point, the therapists tried to initiate a conversation about boundaries. A year after moving to Cortez Island, she appeared on stage at a MAPS event to testify in public to the remarkably positive effects of MDMA therapy. But there was a lot that was happening on Cortez Island that the audience didn't know about, as Ross puts it. One evening, a group of people came to the house, started talking about Salvador Roquette, and Buisson learned that Jensen held this controversial therapist in high esteem. A sexual relationship began between Jensen and Buisson and lasted for approximately a year, uh, a relationship that Dreyer attempted to stop and that Jensen has always maintained was consensual. Commenting on that defense of his conduct, Ross asserts very categorically in the podcast, that doesn't exist, that's not a thing. In other words, there's no such thing as a consensual relationship between a client and their therapist. And of course, in regulatory terms, in most North American jurisdictions, including those relevant here, Ross is absolutely right. Normally, three years must have elapsed since the termination of therapeutic treatment before a former patient can be deemed capable of meaningfully consenting to a sexual relationship. And in fact, the MAPS Code of Ethics for Psychedelic Psychotherapy goes much further, prohibiting sexual relations, sexual and intimate relations, and not only during, but at any time after therapeutic treatment. In regulatory terms then, consent could not have been given, and therefore we're invited, and indeed in a way procedurally obliged, to classify or reclassify this so-called relationship as abuse. Nevertheless, it's also worth noting that beyond this regulatory prohibition, no other evidence is adduced of this being anything other than a relationship of mutual consent. Administrative regulation is here what determines that there could not have been meaningful consent. Not long after Brisson's relationship with Jensen ended, she lodged a series of formal complaints against both of her former therapists, eventually also against MAPS as sponsor of the clinical trial, and ultimately a civil claim for damages against the therapists. As part of Buisson's complaint, MAPS eventually released some 75 hours of video and audio recording of the clinical trial to Buisson, who in turn asked uh, Ross and Nichols, the co-presenters, to watch it on her behalf. In 2022, not long after the podcast series had concluded, an eight-minute video, thank you, uh, telling Megan's story was released in New York Magazine. Uh, containing, we can only presume, the most incriminating footage from those 75 hours. And Buisson is being seen in that video being touched, cuddled, held, occasionally lightly restrained by both therapists. She's also seen in acute distress, as she apparently recalls, under the influence of the drug, the sexual abuse that she'd experienced earlier in her life. Now, she describes commenting on uh, the experience of that therapy. Buisson describes it as her experiencing at the hands of her therapist, in particular Jensen, the most horrendous abuse. Ross and Nichols don't question that assertion, but I think there's room to ask whether or not it's true. Was it the most horrendous abuse? And indeed, was it actually abuse? And I contend that in fact, what we see in the video, when we abstract it from the insistent, suggestive uh, framing uh, and the narrative sequencing in which it occurs, what we actually see in the video are two well-meaning but rather inept therapists using exposure techniques. Exposure techniques which are, are common enough within psychotherapy, but I think uh, generally ill-advised in the context of psychedelically assisted psychotherapy uh, for various reasons that I, I, I could go into but, but won't hear. Um, so um, I think if we listen to the podcast with a, a critical ear, we come up with a, a rather different view of this particular case from that suggested uh, in, in the series. The political black box of trauma is doing a great deal of explanatory and exculpatory work in the presentation. Buisson's agency is discounted in tracking the therapist down to their home. Uh, her agency is also discounted in conducting a year-long intimate relationship with Jensen. Uh, and also her agency is discounted in the way that her view of the therapy changes so radically 
uh, after its conclusion. Now, of course, from the perspective vocally espoused by the podcast's uh, presenters, uh, I'd anticipate that any discussion at all of Buisson's case in terms that don't simply echo, or in their preferred phrase, amplify the so-called testimony of the main protagonist, would be dismissed as minimizing the abuse and indeed as victim blaming. And such a reaction is, is quite to be expected and, and follows a very well-established uh, social script. So I wouldn't have embarked on this analysis had the material not already been put so emphatically in the public domain uh, and uh, exploited to reach, to drive us towards conclusions that I think uh, are, are, are dubious uh, in this case. One of Ross's conclusions about maps in the series is that what I see is willful ignorance of what's going on in the black box of therapy. Uh, what I'd like to say in terms of my, uh, my appreciation of, of the podcast series is actually what I see in Symposia's case is willful ignorance of what's going on in the black box of trauma. So what I've tried uh, to suggest then uh, in this paper uh, is uh, to show something of uh, the individual cultural and political resistance to the possibilities of self-transformation and self-detachment from traumatized identity, which psycho psychedelics enable or enhance pharmacologically. Uh, I've sought to show how one sensationalist expose in distributed fashion uh, helps uh, to condition the mindset of the traumatized and the cultural setting in which therapy might take place, so as to resist and discredit the very possibility of that therapy. You see, what I think the conclusion one reaches in listening to these podcasts, and I think it's the aim of the podcasts actually, uh, is that we all worry a lot more about psychedelics as occasions for uh, abuse and, and danger. And one can understand that uh, performatively as a project of distributed anxiogenesis. In other words, the establishment of countless new sites of worry, the recalibrating of set and cultural setting in the direction of anxiety about risk and danger. And it's for that reason that I've thought it appropriate to offer this alternative view today. Thank you for listening.